All right, you're in Revelation 14, and let's back up real quick to 13 for a second. Title of the message this afternoon is The Patience of the Saints. The Patience of the Saints. And of course, that comes from these two, primarily these two passages, chapter 13, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed uh, with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And then chapter 14, verse 12, it's after it's talking about the, uh, uh, the judgment poured out on those who received the mark of the beast, which we talked about last week. And then it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so when we're talking about the patience of the saints, what we're talking about right away, if you look at the times the Bible talks about that, it's saying that you're patient that God is going to take care of you. You're patient that if you go through trials or whatever, He is going to reward you in, in the end for you know what you've given up. For instance, you know, he said to the apostles, hey, no man has forsaken houses, lands, all those who won't be rewarded, however many fold he says. <laughs> okay, there are great rewards in heaven for the things that we give up on this, on this earth. And so uh, this is what he's talking about, patience of the saints. So back to chapter 13, uh, actually, I have, I have taught this, and I, I think one time I, I, I don't remember what message it was, but I brought this passage up, and I think I mentioned that there's two, possibility, two possible ways to look at this. But that verse in chapter 13, verse 10, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of, and the faith of the saints. I have applied that before, like, hey, if you're going to pick up the sword, you know, during this time of tribulation, you know, hey, let's say World War III breaks out, persecuting Christians or whatever, you take up the sword, well, then you're more likely you're going to die by the sword because you're entering that. And if you just go into captivity, you know, then you have to suffer going into captivity, whatever. But actually, if you read the context and think about that, I can see the, I can see the other point. That basically, with the sword, are going to die by the sword. Those who lead into captivity, they're going to go into captivity. And it's almost like what he's saying to the saints is, hey, don't worry they will be recompensed, you know, for according to what they did. They will be judged on that. And that's the patience of the saints is when you're going through that, remembering, you know, you reap what you sow. And I'm going to keep living for the Lord regardless of what happens because in the end I'm trusting God, you know, that He's going to get me through that. That's the patience of the saints is what I believe. And so uh, I think that makes, that makes better sense. Uh, now, this study helped clarify to me, I think, what that passage is actually talking about. And then in chapter 14, same thing, uh, going through a time of war and uh, persecution of the saints. And it says, uh, this is the patience of the saints when he's pouring out judgment on those who had done, who had done them wrong. Because the saints aren't even, uh, aren't even there at that time. So, uh, so if you would go to, uh, uh, let me see here. Look at Revelation chapter 2. If you're reading through the book of Revelation, this is no surprise to you that uh, this of this concept about enduring trials, tribulations, hardships, uh, persecution, and such. Chapter 2, verse 27, this is when he's talking to the seven churches of Asia or Asia Minor. And if you look at verse 7, it says, He that hath an ear, this is after he talks to the church of Ephesus, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh, Will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? And so he's making this promise to him that overcometh. All right. You could say endure. Another kind of a synonym there. He that endures. He that gets through this and is patient and, and endures all these times. Hey, he's got a reward coming to him. Now, I want to make this clear. I don't think I have to explain this to you. Everybody in here understands. You can't lose your salvation. Neither do you get salvation by your works. So certainly I'm, I'm not saying at any point in this message that only if you continue to do works are you going to go to heaven. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's understood, and I'll show you this more, this is kind of the purpose of the message. Uh, it's understood that as Christians, that's the way we ought to live. We ought to be doing works for the Father. We ought to be enduring. And uh, there's, a, there's a doctrine that came out. It's, it's uh, kind of more of a, a reformed 
uh, doctrine, I guess, came out in Reformation called the perseverance of the saints. Okay, now I've heard it defined different ways, and so I don't make a big deal about the, the, the someone uses that phrase. You know, for me, pers- what, what it says in our Articles of Faith, even at the church, uh, which I know more important what the Bible says than what the Articles of Faith say, but what the Articles of Faith say under uh, preservation, I think it says preservation and pers- uh, perseverance and preservation or something along those lines. And what it talks about, what it labors on is eternal security. So in other words, hey, you are secure in Christ. He's going to make sure that you endure to the end. It's not talking about, hey, if you're, if you're a child, of God, keep doing the works till the end like some people teach. That's not, that's not the connotation. But, uh, but, the, but, but obviously, you know, you will get through to the end. But at the same time, uh, as a Christian, what we want to look at, this isn't a surprise. This isn't a surprise that we should expect that the Christian life is going to be difficult. Salvation's not difficult. Salvation's very simple. Receiving the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, the work that He did, not us. But living the Christian life is a difficult road. That's what the difference between being just one of the multitudes who followed Christ and being those disciples who He said, hey, you've got to leave houses and land and mother and father, and you've got to forsake all and follow me. This was, a, uh, this was something that required dedication. And, uh, and being willing to count the cost and being willing to give up some things and to suffer, this is the, uh, the patience of the saints. Now, uh, let's just keep going. I've got a lot of scripture. I don't apologize for this, but uh, it is a lot more scripture probably than what we usually do, just, just constant reading uh, one scripture after the other. But let's keep going. Revelation uh, 2.11 talks to the next church, Church of Smyrna, and he says, He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Aren't you glad for that? Church of Pergamos, he says, verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And he writes to Thyatira, and in verse 20 he says, uh, let me see here, uh, 22, 21, and I, no, where am I here? Verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a, talking about the millennial kingdom here, rule them with an, a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I uh, received Give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the church saith to seven churches. Get to chapter 3. In verse 5, he's talking to Sardis, and he says, He that overcometh uh, the same shall... His name before my father and before his angels. Let him hear. And and, uh, uh, he, he goes on. So you notice, too, that he's saying this to, even though he's addressing one church at a time, he's including all the churches in this. I mean, this applies to all of them. This is what he says to the churches. Okay, even though in this, in each of these cases, he's, he's, he's addressing the single church. So verse 12, talking to the church of Philadelphia, he says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go right upon him at the my God, and I will write upon him a new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 21, uh, uh, not 21, chapter, okay, yeah, now let's go all the way to chapter, so that was all the church, seven churches there. Chapter 21, verse 7. Verse 7, now we're at the end of the book of Revelation. And he says, uh, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end. Uh, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So it's not a surprise, reading through the book of Revelation, this idea of overcoming and enduring, and in fact, if you've read the other 65 books of the Bible by now, but before you get to this point, it should be no surprise. Okay, All through the Old Testament, your heroes that you think about, right? they all had to endure affliction. You think of Joseph and you think of uh, Daniel and all these guys. In fact, 
uh, we'll look at Daniel here in a second, but all the uh, Old Testament stories and, and uh, the children of, uh, of Israel had to go through these things. And then you get to the prophets, all right? And then when you get to the prophets, here's the thing you got to remember about the prophets. When you read through the book of prophets, a lot of it has to do, most of it has to do with the time period where Israel goes into captivity in Babylon. Okay, and so it's talking about in the present to those people, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They're talking about events that are happening in that world. They, it's significant to them. They're reading that. It applies to them. But there is always a secondary application. And most of it in those prophets, you can read and say, hey, that sounds just like Revelation. Because it's a lot of similar things leading up to, you know, a fulfillment of uh of these pro these things that you read in the prophets, you read it and you're like, oh wow, you know that that's that's quite a thing. I mean, I'm, I I can't even. Well, let's just look at it. Isaiah 66. Have you ever heard about um, interesting idea? Heard about in the, uh, let's see, the Bible within the Bible. Some people will say Isaiah book I mean 66 chapters just like the Bible has 66 books and if you break it down into different parts it looks kind of like the Bible I, I don't necessarily subscribe to all that but I will say this it the, this book ends like Revelation ends okay it, it, it's talking <clears throat> hear the word of the Lord ye that tremble at his word your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. The voice, noise from the city, the voice. Enemies. And you can read that whole chapter and see what I'm talking about, but here he's saying, you know, these guys are saying that they're doing the Lord a favor by treating you badly and uh, and uh, hating you and casting you out. You know, they say that they're doing it for the Lord, but really, in the end, they're the ones that are going to be ashamed. Okay, and he's telling them to endure this. And then it will be rendered recompense to his, en to his enemies, okay? It's an interesting read there. Daniel 12, the same thing. You read Daniel 12, you read Daniel 11, I guess 7 through 12, and you're basically reading the book of Revelation. I mean, it's a, it's just a different, through a slightly different um, perspective, but a lot of things that were going on in that time, but there was a secondary fulfillment uh, that has, that is yet to come. Look at Daniel chapter 12. Waiteth with to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou that thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end. Now that's an interesting fact that, that uses that number. Okay, and then the number you compare that with Revelation, and you're talking about you know, just without trying to get in all the details, you're, you're figuring that out, saying, hey, that's about three and a half years. So there's an enduring that's going on. And he says, blessed to him that makes it through all that time and makes it to that, uh, to that uh, three, uh, I'm sorry, the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. OK, so anyway, there's a, a lot more. I'm not preaching out of Daniel right now, but look at Matthew chapter 10. I got told you there's a lot of scripture to look at. But all through the Bible, this is very consistent. Now, they made it through the captivity, the Babylonian captivity at this point. Uh, the New Testament has begun. Christ has come on the scene. And now Christ is telling his disciples a lot of the same things that Daniel talked about, which kind of proves that they weren't all fulfilled in, in, with Nebuchadnezzar. These are events that are yet to come. And some people think they were fulfilled in 70 AD, but again, there were some things that were similar in 70 AD, but they were only a picture of things to come at the, at the end time. So look at Matthew 10 and verse 22. And ye shall be hate. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. 
but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And you've probably, just like I have, heard people say, hey, you've got to endure, meaning you've got to do the works and act like a Christian and live right in order to get to heaven. Uh, there's people out there that teach that, and they've got that from some of these verses that they've put. He's saying that he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He's not saying that they're only saved, uh, you know, that they're saved spiritually in their position before God because of the works that they did. No, he's saying that you will be saved from that. It'll end. All right, it'll be finished, it'll be done, and then you will come out of that with the rewards. This is the patience of the saints, okay? But then, uh, that was verse 22. Yeah, so now let's go to Matthew 24. Hey, I told you, we every sermon on Revelation, we're going to end up in Matthew 24 at some point. Matthew 24, verse 13. Uh, you know, let's back up and read this. This is... A, a, I know I read this same text every time it seems like, but verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Oh, so you just got to keep doing the works so then you can be saved? No, that's not what it's saying. I've heard people say, it's kind of a, a hyper-dispensationalist view, but I've heard people say, you see, this is, this is talking about tribulation saints, those who are in the tribulation who are under a different dispensation, and they say, in the different dispensation, you have to do works to be saved. Well, that doesn't make sense. God's always saved the same way. It's always been through faith, Old Testament, New Testament, future time. It's always faith in Jesus Christ. We overcome through the blood of the Lamb and by what He did. Even in Revelation, it says that. And so that, that has to be a mis, uh, misinterpretation for sure. Okay, let's go to uh, Mark, Mark 13. We'll get to the sermon here in a minute. Mark 13, look at verse 12. In this chapter, he says it this way. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall call, call social services, on, I mean, and shall cause them to be put to death. And he shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. To the end, the same shall be saved. Go to Luke 8. I just don't know. We still have several more to read. We can do it. We can do it. This is God's Word. This is what we're here for. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. I could have made this a sword drill. Bible's up. You guys ever do that in vacation Bible school? Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Okay, so this is the parable where Jesus is talking about the different seeds that fell on the different types of soil. And in verse 15, it says, But that on, a, on the good ground... I'm sorry, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. All right, that's the key, with patience, right? What's the title of the message? This is the patience of the saints. And so here's what he's talking about is keeping the word with patience. Those who are Christians, it's expected that they're going to patiently continue. They're going to patiently go through I didn't say that's the mission. Well, if they were saved, they would do this. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it's expected that a Christian should go through those things when they live for the Lord. All right. Uh, all right. We're just going to keep going. Acts 14. This is important. Acts 14. Look at verse 22. Start with this is a good passage of scripture I use for what we call discipleship, you know, going back to those who who have made a profession and kind of making sure they're saved and, and re uh, you know re hashing that, going back over that, and then talking about taking the next step about baptism and getting involved in church. Hey, this is important to go back. Oh, that's verse 21. In that city, and 
many. And that we must perhaps tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now, there's not a whole lot of preachers preaching that right now. <laughs> Going back and confirming the saints and saying, hey, you've got to go through much tribulation, much trial, much hard. Hey, be willing to lay down your life for Christ. Be willing to give things up for Christ. A lot of times it's we just want it easy and we just, we just want to get a, a, a free pass through this life and not have to worry about that. I got my mansion up in heaven with the the fishing lake and the in the pond in the backyard and it's like I don't think you're understanding this Christian life <laughs> you know uh, uh, anyway so let's move on to Galatians Galatians I'm just showing you that by the time you get to Revelation this should not be a secret to you that we will endure much tribulation Galatians chapter 6 Verse 9, Galatians 6, 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, see the patience implied there, in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Okay. When you're enduring, when you're pressing on, you're getting through the hard times, you're reminded in the back of your, your head, you're saying, hey, the Lord's going to reward me for this. I'm doing this for the Lord. You know, I was talking about this morning uh, about those who uh, uh, are offended, right? And sometimes, hey, in this world, you're gonna offenses are going to come. And when you're offended, and by offended, I mean someone did you wrong. They sinned against you, right? And when they do that, and then they uh, they repent of that, and they you rebuke them, and they repented of that, and then you says you're supposed to just forgive them. And then if they come to you seven times in a day, it says just forgive them seven times. And I was like, a lot of people think, hey, I can't do that. That's just too hard. Well, do it anyway. You're doing it as unto the Lord. You're saying, but I don't like that person. I don't want to forgive him. Well, who cares? God said to do it, so do it because he said it. And so you're, you're honoring the Lord and you're being patient. You're saying, he's going to take care of this. Now, there is an, a responsibility to rebuke. There is a responsibility at some point to you know, put somebody out from among you or whatever the Bible talks about. But for the most part, we are following Christ by doing things that we don't necessarily want to do in this life. Okay? Look at, uh, where are we at? 2 Timothy. Second Timothy 4. Let's start with verse 1 there. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry and so uh, then paul goes on to talk about how he's ready to be offered up he's certainly endured a lot and so we see a sense in which we're to endure look at hebrews chapter 12 chapter 6 And verse 11, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to, uh, to the full assurance of hope unto the end. All right? Don't sign up for this Christian thing and say, I'll just, I'll test it out for a little while. I'll test the waters and see if it's the lifestyle I like. No, no, no. You're signing up unto the end. All right? Uh, and you might say, well, I'm going to, I trust in the Lord, but you know what? If I don't like this, I'm going to, I'm going to just go my own way and go back to the world. You will never go back to the world in peace. The Father's always going to chasten you. The Father's always going to make sure that you are understanding that He's got much better things for you. 
and uh, and you're you're choosing to forsake that, and you're going to live with the consequences of that. Okay, and so we in the Christian life understand, hey, God's getting us through this thing to the end, and uh, and and we got to be ready for all these things. Okay, let's see, <clears throat> James. You're in Hebrews, James. To Revelation. James one twelve. <clears throat> Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Now, temptation there isn't just talking about tempted to sin. It's saying trials, afflictions. All those words are synonymous. He endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Okay, and so there's an enduring pro process there. Look at Jude. <clears throat> How many looked over and looked at Jude? You, you people. Jude, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Okay, so you're keeping yourself in the love of God. You're looking for, to the finish line, if you will, and uh, unto that eternal life, you're getting all there. Now, you understand this. We're, we are saved at the moment. I'm talking about this tonight, and uh, I think I, I get my sermons mixed up. I think I'm talking about this tonight in uh, Iola. And we're saved. We understand that. But the Bible talks about, like, you know, our salvation will be, you know, will go, come into fruition, if you will. So we're saved in the sense that, hey, I'm not going to lose my salvation. I'm already seated in heavenly places, if you will. My name's written in the book. It's not going to be blotted out. But there's a sense in which we look forward to the day where we are saved, right? And that we actually see these things uh, come to play, right? So I want to show you in this passage, primarily chapter 12, I mean chapter 13 and chapter 14 of Revelation, just three groups of people, if you will, told to demonstrate patience. I don't think I said that right, but <laughs> number one, look at uh, chapter 14. This is where we started reading this this morning. <clears throat> we see immediately in this text the 144,000. Now, if you remember, we I preached on the 144,000 a while back when we were in chapter 7. Go ahead and go there. Hold your place in, in 13 as well. And I preached on the sealing before the seal or something like that. So before the seventh seal is opened, we see the 144,000 being sealed. And, uh, and in chapter 7, we see these people. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So in the seventh seal, God's wrath is going to be poured on, out upon the earth. We understand that once the seventh seal is open, now we're talking about doom, gloom, Comets coming down from the sky, or stars coming down, whatever, and, uh, and, and great things happening, okay? But he says, wait, before those things happen, we're going to seal the 144,000 in their foreheads. Now, if you've been following along in this series, I've made it clear, and I think proven, actually, that chapter 12 is kind of a stopping point. The end of chapter 11 is kind of like we're done with this first, like, vision, if you will. And now we're going to see the vision again, slightly different perspective, but we're talking about the same thing. And one way you can see that is just by the, the timeline that he talks about these days, these, these uh, 1,200, I can't remember what it is, 1,300, anyway, <laughs> whatever three and a half years is, okay? And we see those, you know, those time periods, and then there's another time period. And look, we know that the whole time is seven years and so you know what are all these other after you get past chapter 12 it starts using those times again 
you know, what, how many years are we talking here? Okay, so in chapter 12, I believe it's, it's evident, and I've already preached this, that this is where we're starting over again. Okay, it goes back to, uh, this is the passage I'm talking about in Iola tonight, uh, but it goes back to basically the birth, actually the seed of the woman, and then later on the birth of Christ, and the dragon, I'm talking about the devil, is seeking to... Uh, uh, and so, uh, so anyway, now when we get to chapter 14, we're basically seeing the same thing that we saw in chapter 7, but a slightly different perspective, okay? And he says, and lo, I looked and lo, he stood on Mount Sinai. We're reading for chapter 14 now. And with him, an 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harp. That makes sense because we read about in uh, chapter 6 about the elders up in heaven and the harps and, uh, and every, playing the music before the Lord. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. Again, talked about those in chapter 6. And no man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. The they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. The first point I want to make is that the 144,000 had patience in their lifetime. They had patience. They endured to the end. They, this was the patience of the saints. They endured hardship and all this. And I believe, and I've explained this before, there's a difference of opinions on this, and it's okay if someone disagrees with me, but I believe that the 144,000 are coming up in the resurrection with all other uh, Old Testament saints that are being resurrected in the rapture, okay? The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those that are, are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with them in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. These things are taking place, and we see those first fruits, if you will, being the Old Testament saints that come back. Now, out of those Old Testament saints that come back, I believe there are 144,000 that are already designated, all right? 12,000 out of each tribe, each 12 tribes, already designated for this position that they're going to have in the end times, okay? And so there's a special sealing that takes place uh, as they receive their new bodies or whatever. I don't know how this works exactly, but they receive these bodies, but they still have to be sealed so that they won't be hurt and... Uh, on the earth during this time. That's what I believe, okay? Uh, but regardless of what happens, we can see by the, by the text here that these were godly men in their lifetime. What did it say? They, uh, they follow the Lamb wherever they go. With it says they weren't defiled of women. They are virgins. And it says that they're, uh, uh, let me see, I think it's the next verse. In verse 5, it says, In their mouth was found no guile. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, obviously, once we're in heaven, we're all without fault because this, earth, this flesh perish, perishes, and that which is incorruptible, which is inside of us, lives with Christ forever. Okay, so, so we are all faultless. But I think the idea is that there is something special about these 144,000 virgin, male virgins, if you will. Not Jehovah's Witnesses, but male, <laughs> okay, saints, okay. And... and I've always found it interesting, why are they virgins? What's the point of that? Okay, Why is it important to point out that these men have never been with women? You, what I think is a, is a, you know, a good point to... Second Kings, I'm sorry. Second Kings, chapter 20. In verse 18. Now, this is a prophecy about things that are going to happen, okay? And we begin reading about that later on. And that goes into the time I was talking about of the kept, uh, ba uh, Babylonian captivity that was predicted. And during that Babylonian captivity, uh, we see that some of the children of Israel are taken in as slaves, okay? And so here's what it says in this verse here, chapter 20, verse 18, 2 Kings. It says, And of thy sons 
that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Look at Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. You're familiar with this story here. Let's just start with verse 3. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, skillful in wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them uh, to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning of the tongues of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank so nourished them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of, of Meshach, and of Azariah of Abednego. So you see here specifically saying that these guys are under the prince of the eunuchs. Well, why is he called the prince of the eunuchs? Because the people that he is over are eunuchs. Why were they made eunuchs? Because they were going to be servants of the king. So they were taken in, like it said in 2 Kings, they were taken in from their land. And they were taken into Babylonia and they were made eunuchs, which means these young men never had the, the privilege and blessing of having a wife and being with her and being able to have children and all that stuff. But what's interesting is you watch their life. You watch a man like Daniel taken in that situation, made a slave. And what does he do? To the best of his ability, he submits to the king. Now, not to the extent of being, you know, bowing down to a statue or or not, pray, not praying whenever he tells them not to pray. No, he's still going to stand up and he's going to obey God rather than man. But whenever he's obeying man, whenever he's obeying the king, whenever he's interpreting the dreams or what, whatever he's doing, what does he always say? Well, I'm not, I'm doing this for the Lord or the Lord's interpreting this dream or whatever. He's like, hey, I am just following the Lord. And these guys were servants. Now, obviously, there's not, I don't think there's 144,000 here in Daniel, but I'm saying that in their lifetime, I could see where, hey, these are people that gave up great things for the Lord. Some of the disciples, man, they gave up lots of stuff, left their families, not necessarily their, their wife and kids, but, uh, but they left their homes and their fathers and their businesses and all that and followed the Lord. And he promised, I'm going to bless you for that. I'm going to reward you exceedingly for that in heaven. Great is your reward, right? And so I believe that these 144,000, it makes, uh, uh, makes it clear that these were men that gave up these things. And, uh, and as a re or had to because of persecution or whatever. And as a result of that, uh, he is going to bless them. 144,000 were patient in their lifetime. And I believe that uh, because of that, they will receive great rewards. Okay. Now, how about those who live in these final days leading up to the rapture? Okay. We're, we all agree that we're raptured out of here before the, uh, the judgment of God in the seven seals and the seven vile judgments. I think we're all on the same page there. Uh, but there are what we would call the tribulation of those days, or what uh, Matthew 24 talks about, the tribulation of those days, where we know that we're going through some sort of uh, tribulation. And we know in, uh, look back at Revelation 13. So we're in chapter 14, but you remember last week we talked about the mark of the beast and and all these things, the false prophets that rise up. And, and it says in chapter 13, verse 7, And it was given unto him, talking about what we call the Antichrist or the beast, it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the, of the world. So there are some who receive the mark, who worship the beast and the idol and the dragon. And then there are those who, who, who don't do all that. And of course, war is going to be made with these people. And so this is what they're, they're, they're going through this time of, 
of warfare. Look at chapter 14 now and verse 8. The phrase, uh, I'll talk about this more in a later uh, lesson, but uh, Babylon is talking about, apparently, the, uh, it's called she's also called the great whore. And the idea is that they should be going after the Lord, but they're going after false gods and, and all this and following the beast and everything. So the whole thing, the whole system is called the mystery Babylon. So chapter 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying. Now it's interesting if uh, there's an angel talked about in chapter uh, uh, 7 as well, around the time of the 144,000. Remember the other angel that comes and says, hey, before you, you got the four angels, and then you got another angel that comes down and says, hurt not the earth anyway. Uh, verse 8 says, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel uh, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. What does it say in verse 12? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the grace of God and the faith of Jesus. So here it is. They're not going to receive the mark. They're going to endure this persecution and this tribulation that's coming and this... Uh, 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 this war that's being uh, ha had uh, uh, against them. And so they endure that, okay? So in these final days leading up to the, the, the rapture, because the rapture, I believe, is like right at this point, in my opinion, okay? That is uh, fixing to, to happen. These people are being patient, okay? Application, all right? Because uh, it's not really here in the text, but through application, we need to be enduring. We need to, uh, the, those of us who are trying to live godly in 2020, are we in tribulation? No. <laughs> right? Are we even really receiving persecution? No. But if you can't, you know, if you can't, uh, how's it say, if you can't run with the footmen, how are you going to be able to contend with the horses, right? <laughs> if you can't stand and live godly in 2020, what are you going to do if you do re start receiving persecution? I mean, look, there's a lot of other countries where they don't have the liberties we have, and they are receiving way more, Christians are receiving way more persecution than we are. There are some places you go to jail for having a Bible. There are some places if you got caught witnessing, you would uh, you'd be put to death even. We in the United States, we don't understand that. Okay, So sometimes it's tempted, maybe tempting for us not to be on fire and do things for the Lord. But hey, you, we are going to have to live godly in 2020 and uh, I don't pretend uh, like I know what it feels like to go through great persecution but we need to be willing to go through persecution 2 Timothy uh, 3.12 says yea and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution now, we don't go around looking for it <laughs> we don't go around doing I hope not anyway doing dumb things so that we'll get persecuted you know and, or we'll be able to claim persecution but if we're living godly in Christ Jesus it says that you shall suffer persecution it's a natural effect Jesus warned of that and he said hey they're going to hate you but don't worry they hated me before they hate you or he says it's not really you that they hate it's me that they hate so you go around preaching the word of God those who hate the Lord that they're going to hate you you knock on someone's door. Hey, I'm from Iola Baptist Temple. Get lost, you blankety blank blank. Why do you do it? They don't hate you. They hate God. <laughs> you didn't do it. They don't even know you. Why would they hate you? They hate God. Or maybe they hate the Jehovah's Witness that knocked on their door last week. But, but you said Baptist. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. You, you know they go out of their way. You know, why would an atheist who rejects God, hates God, go out of their way to like just go down people's list and hit every Facebook page and hit every email. It's like, man, you don't even believe in God. You claim, you claim there's no, uh, etern there's no life after death. 
Why would you waste all your time going on people's pages and trying to talk to them about how stupid their beliefs are? Right? Because it's not, they don't hate you, they hate God. And they want to be an enemy of God, and they're just following uh, the, the, the ploy of the devil. We may never have to endure the Christ or the beast or the great tribulation of those days where we're fleeing into the mountains and running for our lives. Uh, the resurrection. We might not ever have to do that, but we have constantly got an enemy that we're fighting. We've constantly got forces. You say, well, I don't really a whole lot of persecution. Yeah, but there's three enemies that we deal with as Christians. I recently was talking to somebody on the phone who called me and said they're struggling with some different sins in their life and everything, and they said, I just don't understand. If I'm really saved, you know what I mean? If I'm really saved, why don't I just naturally have a desire to do all these things? Am I not and uh, and the, here's what I here's what I've noticed with this person and anybody. The longer they stay out of church, the longer they, uh, you know, the more time they spend in the world, the more time they spend with other, the more they begin feeling that way. Like, why don't I just love the Lord? Why don't I just want to serve Him? Why why don't why how come I'm not you know willing to go through persecution and trouble and try? The reason why is because there's more than just the devil as an enemy out there. First of all. All right, we do have the devil as an enemy, but sometimes we make the devil's job pretty easy, don't you think? <laughs> There's another enemy out there that's just the flesh, right? The flesh just has a desire contrary to what we're supposed to do, and this is why we only continue on, even though we don't want to do it. We make ourselves do it, you know. Uh, you know, probably one of the. Uh, most challenging times of patience for Brother Austin was whenever he tried to endure the 100-mile potluck with me. Because <laughs> I was going really slow, and he had to be patient. <laughs> right? But at some point, you have to make up your mind and say, hey, I'm getting through this thing one way or another. Pain can only, can only get so painful. <laughs> you, ever think that? you get to the point where you're like, well, it can't hurt any worse. So I might as well just keep on going, right? You got to endure. You got to get this mindset that says, I'm in this for the long haul. And I'm, I'm going to endure. Now, as Christians and as humans, we got ups and downs. I understand that. But we have to have this mindset that I'm going to keep. That's why it says a righteous man falls seven times and gets back up, right? Uh, we want to keep on getting up. We want to keep moving forward. And we want to keep enduring. Okay, uh, we have not only the devil, but we've got the world. And not everybody in the world is just like this demon-possessed person that's trying to get you to follow Satan. But, hey, they want you to hang out with them and do the things that they do. And, hey, I don't follow the Christ, so why don't you, uh, you know, uh, do the things that I do? Aren't these fun? I mean, aren't you tired of living like a Christian and doing all these kind of things? And the world will pull you so far away. And I'm telling you, if you're hanging out in the world and you're neglecting the reading of your Bible and you're neglecting going to church and hearing being under sound preaching and Bible teaching, if you're neglecting all those things, you're going to feel so lost. You're going to feel unsaved sometimes even. You're going to feel like, you know, uh, uh, why don't I love God the way that I should, right? Because at some point, you weren't patient and you just kind of let the things of the world, the devil or the flesh, take control of you. And so we read this about the 144,000 and say, hey, man, these are great men. They're going to get great rewards in heaven. Yeah, but then you look at their life and what they probably went through. In order to reach that status where God said, I'm going to bless you exceeding abundantly and, and uh, you're going to have great rewards in heaven. And you start looking at your own life and you start thinking, do I even have that many rewards in heaven? <laughs> what have I really given up? What have I really had to suffer? <clears throat> and then uh, anyway, so, uh, so we have to constantly remind ourselves to do that and to demonstrate in our own lives, to our family, our friends, to our children, we need to demonstrate the patience of the saints. All right, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll help us uh, to remember uh, why you've saved us and the job that you've given us to do. Help us to continue to, uh, to endure uh, and not just enduring persecution because sometimes that's not there, but to endure um, uh, and patiently in living the Christian life and denying the flesh and forsaking uh, the world, not walking in the world, and and uh, and making ourselves read your word and and uh, hear it preaching and all this stuff. Help us to uh, to to endure in that way and have patience 
Lord, and, and uh, look for opportunities that we lay up treasures in heaven by serving you and giving a little bit more of ourselves to you and to your work and to, to other people, getting them saved and investing in them. Lord, I pray you be pleased with what we do as a church and uh, what we do each of us individually as we seek to serve you. I pray that you will uh, bless our efforts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.